Hello, I'm Jeremy, and today we're going to take a look at one of my absolute favorite board games, and this is the Princes of Florence, which doesn't necessarily look like much from this box, but it's really terrific inside. The game is designed by Richard Ulrich and Wolfgang Kramer, and I believe it was originally published back in 2000, and it's a game that has a lot of different mechanisms and combined into a really interesting way. It's a game where you're going to be playing um, various families who are patrons of the arts in Renaissance Italy and each of them is going to be creating a palazzo to have artists work in and try to inspire the artists to go on to create great works and in practice the game has a lot of weird um, mechanisms Frankenstein onto each other so there's going to be a tile placement action um, aspect there's going to be some economic uh, money management there's going to be auctions but and at the same time the game really works very well um, at combining those into something that feels deeply strategic and really satisfying so the game it plays in about 90 minutes or so and the game officially plays from three to five players although there is a two-player variant in the new version that's works relatively well um, but let me take a minute to show you how the game plays and I'll come back and let you know what I think about it. The Princes of Florence is a game that's going to be played over seven rounds in which players are going to be playing various families who are patrons of the art during the Renaissance. Uh, each player is going to get one of these boards which has both a player aid that shows you all of the great works that your family could help complete. It shows you the various turn structure over here but more importantly here it shows you your area where you're going to have a palazzo which is essentially a compound for artists where you're going to build various things to inspire artists to create great works so the way that the game plays is that each player is going to get at the start of the game thirty five hundred dollars and that's going to be the uh, currency in the game as well as three profession cards which represent various artists that they've attracted to their compound who are going to be able to create great works at the start of the game, you'll get three of these and you're going to select two. And the way that these cards work is really the uh, crux of the game. Essentially, each um, type of profession is going to have certain requirements for things that inspire them. So for example, this uh, choreographer, they want you to have an opera in your compound in order so that they could work. And they like to have the uh, fo forest as a landscape in your compound. And they like to have, each will have a freedom that they like. This one likes travel. Then each card will have these bottom three categories as well. So these top three are going to be specific to a given artist, but all of them will benefit from these things. So those categories are a jester, profession cards. So essentially having other artists in your compound creates creativity and then bonus cards, which I'll explain in a moment. Those will give you one-off bonuses. So by create by having these things available to your artists over the course of the game they're going to produce better works so essentially you would tally up which of these things you have and the total of that will be considered the work value and the higher work value that you have the more potential money and points you will get over the course of the game so looking at these various requirements you'll try to pick um at the start of the game two of these cards that tend to have synergy so for example here i have a sculptor and a painter and they both like the studio building so i might keep those two cards the other card you'll discard to the bottom of the profession card pile so each player will do that at the start of the game and then the game itself will begin and the game like i said is played over seven rounds and each round's divided into two phases and they're all broken down here on your player board first there's going to be an auction phase and each player is going to buy one of these various items here so there's one two three four five six seven items to pick from each player could buy one of those items and each item can only be sold once in the auction and then there's going to be an action phase where each player gets two actions so each player is only going to be buying one thing in the auction phase and performing two actions uh, for each of the seven rounds so the um, auction phase works like this. So out of these seven items, whoever has the first player marker will pick one to put up for auction. So for example, this player here, they see that their artist likes to have a lake. They might choose to put that up for auction. And the way that the auctions work is very scripted. Um, the player who chooses the item for, up for auction will make an initial bid of $200. You can't bid more, you can't bid less. And then each player in turn order would be able to 
either raise that bid or pass, and you can only raise by $100 increments, and they will keep going around until a, a winner emerges. So for example, this player would choose this and bid 200. This player could bid 300 or pass, let's say they bid 300. Let's say this player passes, now back to the blue player, they could bid 400 or pass, let's say they say 400. Green player says 500, blue player passes, the green player gets it, gets to take this item and immediately add it to any space in their palazzo except for this space that's covered. So that would be the way that this would work. Now, since the blue player did not win that item, they would be able to choose any of the other items, but not the same item to put up for auction. So their other artists, for example, would like to have a forest, so they might choose that. So they might say 200 for that. You know, the red player, he wants something else entirely, so let's say he passes, the blue player will get this for 200. They pay that money to the bank, and then they get to add that item to their board. So for example, this could be placed anywhere on here. And let's just say that they choose to place it here. Well, that would be a bad placement, but let's say they place it here. So this will just stay. And once you place these items, they'll stay fixed for the rest of the game. But you can see you have this grid to work within over the course of the game. So if they place that there, that's fine. That would be their turn. Actually, that might be an even better placement. And then the red player, because they have not yet bought anything in the auction, would get to choose something else to buy for 200. And let me explain what all the items are. So there's these three types of landscapes, which will help add work value to your given uh, professions. There are the uh, lakes, the parks, and the forests. There are these builders, which in the second fa phase of the game, you'll be able to construct the building, such as the studio for these artists. Normally those are gonna cost $700 and could not be placed next to each other. By buying builders, you'll be able to alter those rules. So the first builder that you get reduces the cost of a building from 700 to 300. The second builder that you get, it allows you to place buildings adjacent to one another. And the third builder that you get it allows you to um, build for free. So normally when you build buildings, they cannot not touch except for diagonally. So I would be able to place this here, that would be fine, but I would not be able to place it here. Again, this would be fine because those are only touching diagonally, but that would not be fine unless I had that second builder. I should also mention that the uh, second and third builder, each when you acquire those, you'll get three points each. Also for every building that you build, you'll get three points each and for if you ever acquire a second of the same landscape type, so for example, a second lake or a second forest, those will give you three points each. You are only allowed to build one of each type of building. So those are the uh, builders. The next things are the jesters. Everybody loves the jesters. They will give any work that you get or that you produce over the course of the game an extra two work value. Um, so those are almost like wild cards. There are these prestige cards, which give you the potential for end game points. If you win the auction for this, you'll draw five of them, select one. And you can see, for example, these will give you points for this card, the most likes. And if you have the most likes at the end of the game, you will get six points. If you are tied for the most likes, you would get the number in parentheses. So for example, that would be three points. This one's for the most forests. This one's for the most parks. This one's for the fewest empty spaces on your palazzo board. Um, this one is if you have at least one builder, one jester, and two landscapes. So these are going to vary, um, and they will be conditional based on what you've accomplished over the course of the game, but they could be an additional source of victory points. Finally, the last thing that you could get is a recruiting card, and this would count as a profession card as long as you hold it in your hand, which would add one to any work value. As you could see here, each profession card gives you one for work values. and. It has an additional benefit. If another player plays a profession card to complete a work, that stays down in front of them. And as a free action, you could swap that with the recruiting card, which will go into your hand, so then you could create that work later. So that's always good. And to help you discern what the uh, requirements for each card are, the game numbers each card and lists all the requirements on your player board. So for example, if I saw that a player had played number 17, I could just look at my, my player board here and see that that would require the hospital, forest, and travel to be uh, you know, produced as a work. Um, uh, once you replace that with the other player, this will still count as one toward any work that that player completes. Profession cards, whether you have them in your hand, whether you've played them to complete a work, um, 
or whether it's just a recruiting card, they all add one work value. Even the one that you're in the process of playing will be worth one work value. So that's important to remember. So those recruiting cards just are, allow you to get additional profession cards. And those are the various things that you could get in the auction. Like I said, the auction round will go until each player has bought two, one of those items and then the action phase will begin and the action phase is laid out here and you can see that you're going to get two actions and those are taken one at a time in turn order so the first things that you could do are buy freedoms so like the um the various features and the various buildings uh the uh professions are going to want various things as a freedom so for example this painter wants the freedom to travel and that would add three work value if you had that present so these are going to be supply limited there's going to be one fewer of each freedom than the number of players and you could buy that for three hundred dollars and you just would add it to your player board to show that you have it um, and that consumes an action the second thing to do is to buy an additional profession card from those that weren't yet taken you would similarly just draw five of those and add one to your hand and that would give you another potential work to complete the third thing is for $300 to buy um, a bonus card and these give you a one-time boost to work value based on what you have present in your palazzo. So for example, this one, if you have a small, medium, or large building, each type of those will be worth two points. Each building that you have would be worth one point. Each forest would be worth two points each landscape one point so you see these will be very conditional you'll pick the one that best suits you return the other four to the bottom of the uh, pile and like i said when you complete a work which is another action which i'll explain in a minute you could augment that by playing those bonus cards alongside them and then finally um the you could buy buildings and again the base cost for those is 700 but if you've built or if you've won those builders in the auctions that would reduce the cost and Again, here you see I have two cards that would require the studio. I might choose to acquire the uh, studio for 700. I would pay that money to the bank and then I would be able to add it anywhere onto my board except for adjacent to another building unless I had a builder. So for example, if I put that here, that might make sense. So again, like the, um, the various landscapes, those cannot be moved once you place them. So finally, the last thing that you could do on your turn as an action is to um, acquire um, or to create one of, one of the uh, work cards from the profession cards that you have in your hand. So you'll notice also that you could only acquire one freedom during a turn. You can only acqui acquire one profession card during a turn. The other things you could do with both of your actions. But anyway, to um, show you how to, to create a work, here's an example. Let's see, I have this sculptor here and the sculptor you could see here he likes the studio which i've built he likes the forest which i've built so that would be four work value for that three work value for that i did not yet acquire my freedom of religion i don't have any jesters but i have two profession cards the one that i have not yet played the one that i am currently playing so that would add two to my work value so i'd have four seven eight nine I don't have any bonus cards to play, but that would be nine work value. So I play this in front of me. The nine work value is ahead of the minimum of seven for the round, so I'd be able to produce that work. I would then place my player marker on the nine space to show that I've produced a work value of nine this round. And now I would get a payout. So I would get either $900, um, which I could just take, or I could buy victory points for a cost of $200 each at this point. You can only make that decision immediately upon completing a work to buy victory points like that. So for example, if I chose to take two victory points, I would then take 500 in money, and that would be the end of my completing that work. Again, this will continue to serve as one profession card, even though I've played it. So these are the various actions that you're gonna be able to do during a round. And once every player has completed two of these, the action phase will end. Then the turn order marker will, mar will move. You'll move on to the next round. The required work value will go up, and then you'll just go back to an auction phase, starting with the new starting player. And so you'll just keep alternating between auction and action phase for the seven rounds until um, you've completed 
all seven rounds. At the end of that, you will basically look at who's earned the most points during the game. You'll add on any prestige cards that you've required and qualified for as victory points. And then um, simply whoever has the most points at the end of doing that will win. And in the case of a tie, money would be the tiebreaker. And that's how you play Princes of Florence. Okay, so that is the Princes of Florence, and like I said at the start of the video, this is one of my absolute favorite uh, board games, and I don't know that it exactly comes through from a video explanation of it, why this is so great. And for me, I think that it's uh, a game that definitely rewards strategy. Uh, at the start of the game, you're going to get those profession cards, which essentially give you a list of tasks that you have to accomplish in order to make those artists happy. And just trying to get those uh, task done with limited resources with limited number of turns is where the game's challenge is and I find it to be an interesting puzzle every time that I play and even though I've played you know dozens of times at this point I still find it extremely interesting to keep going back to that well and figuring out how to use you know seven auction rounds and 14 actions over the course of the game to put on you know seven eight nine works over the course of the game and it's just really satisfying trying to balance those various elements and it's interesting you know from this rules expert Explanation. you probably could tell that there's a lot going on in this game there's tile placement there's auctions there's set collection and so on but at the same time all these elements really work well together with one another um, there's not anything that seems to override another element and there are really smart design decisions throughout the game that I really appreciate something like for example on your building when you're building buildings to your palazzo these small buildings are easier to place, but they're only going to satisfy maybe one of those various professions. Whereas the bigger, bigger buildings are going to take up more space on your Palazzo's real estate, but they're going to satisfy multiple artists. So even something like the spatial relations of that part of the game function into the efficiency engine of the other part of the game. And just the way that those things all work together really makes this a, you know, a fantastic game. It's a game that I think definitely does require players to do a play through in order to get you know some sense of how all those various interconnected pieces work together but it's not one that I find especially complicated um, I just yesterday played a game with all new players um, and although I won and I'm not you know the best board game player in the, the world by any means um, I felt that by the end of the game the p other players were definitely playing better than they were at the start of the game and I think that that's satisfying to see people grok on to what's going on in this game over the course of it and it's a game that you know Although there's a lot of pieces, they all fit together so well that there's a certain intuitive sense about how the game's logic works, and that I find really appealing. It's not something that's obtuse for the sake of being obtuse. And everything that's in this game, although there's a lot of different elements, has a definite place, and it's just something that seems top-down, you know, just very well designed, and something that I really respond to. Um, I tend not to like more complicated, rules-heavy games, and this is definitely, for my taste, a more complicated game, but at the same time, it's something that I've absolutely enjoyed every play of. It's something I'm imagine I'll be playing for you know years to come and it's something that works extremely well with um, even people who are somewhat less experienced at board games I should mention that this game has had a spiritual successor in the form of um, Colosseum which is another game that was designed by the uh, same design team and I find that one also pretty good but this is I think just the better design overall it's a cleaner design it has um, you know the a better auction mechanism and but that is a uh, maybe a more um thematically interesting game to certain people I, I know some people find this game to be a little bit you know visually drab and whatnot and that's fine um coliseum is still something i i would be happy to play and i think it's also just in the process of getting reprinted this one is still i think in print it's not hard to track down so it's a game that I would encourage everybody to give a shot to. It's one of my absolute favorites, and um, I hope that this video helped uh, turn a few more people on to The Princes of Florence.